Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. What I say today, I do not say easily, nor do I say it lightly. But the time has come for a second American Revolution. Opponents of this would call it a civil war, but that's not what it is. It would be a war to restore the Constitutional Republic. Now, I want to be clear about a couple of things on my own position, just so things make sense as I go through. I am what they call a small l libertarian. I am not a member of the Libertarian Party. I think they're a bunch of idiots who can't agree on the color of an orange. But I do have strong leanings toward what is called anarcho-capitalism. I won't explain what that is. It's too complicated for this video. Suffice to say that I would like to see even less government than is currently authorized by the United States Constitution. And that is what I really generally advocate for. However, I have often said, and I think many people on the right and the left can agree with this, that I would settle for a restoration of the Constitutional Republic. We do not presently have a constitutional republic. The U.S. Constitution, contrary to popular belief, is not a living document. It is the federal government's rule book. It spells out very specifically what powers the federal government has, and then it says that under the Tenth Amendment, any other power is is um, uh, left to the states or the people. And in fact, the Tenth Amendment specifically reads, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or the people. It is not a living document. It is not up for interpretation. It is a specific document saying what the federal can, government can do and what it cannot. Presently, the federal government usurps all power from the states or the people. Now, as an example of things that the federal government is not authorized to be involved in, medicine, specifically medical care, insurance, drugs, and get this, that includes alcohol, experimental drugs, marijuana, heroin, cocaine, and morphine. If you want those things to be illegal, it is not a federal matter. If you want those things to be illegal, take it up with your state government. Similarly, things like contraception, including abortion. Now, I know many of my friends on the right who consider abortion murder. Maybe it is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with you on that. What I am going to say is just like murder, it is not a federal issue. Murder is not a federal crime. Murder is handled always at the state level. So if you think abortion is murder, take it to your state government. When you make a federal case out of it, it only encourages those people in government to grab more power. Take it to your state government, just like murder. Other things that the federal government is not authorized to be involved in, education, whether it's curriculum, funding, student loans, or the cost of tuition. There's very little that the federal government is, involved, is supposed to be involved in with respect to economics. This would include a minimum wage, jobs, employee ownership, labor unions, housing, none of it. It is not authorized to be involved in scientific research, not even funding it. That includes space exploration, global warming, net neutrality, energy production, whether it's coal, oil, nuclear, wind, or solar. There is no authorization to be involved in infrastructure, including roads or the Internet, nor communications, whether it's print, broadcast, or Internet. It is not authorized to be involved in international trade, except when it involves a treaty that was ratified by the U.S. Senate, and then only if that treaty deals with the powers that are left to the federal government. Under the Second First Amendment, my God, there is certainly no reason. It is totally unconstitutional for, for the federal government to be involved in the press, whether it be print, broadcast, or Internet, nor free speech, whether it be print, broad, broadcast, or Internet. There is almost nothing that the federal government is supposed to be involved in in terms of national policy. This would include the NSA, the total surveillance state that has been created by the NSA over the last 20 years. 
is explicitly forbidden by the Fourth Amendment, which reads, The right of the people to be secure in their persons, papers, houses, and effects, and keep that word in mind, effects, against unreasonable search and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants issued but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. All the, federal, all the things that the NSA currently does fall under the heading of that word, effects. That is a broad word that basically includes anything about you, anything that you personally have. The data about you, your phone calls, everything, are your effects. What they do is flatly unconstitutional under any sane reading of the Constitution. There is also no authorization for something like the FBI. It didn't exist 100 years ago, and it has been corrupt since day one. Just to Google J. Edgar Hoover, who was the first director of the FBI. The problems that we see with the FBI today are no different than the problems that we have seen with them since it was formed. Similarly, the CIA, there is no federal authorization for the CIA. If you're going to have an intelligence agency at best, at best, it should be working under a wing of the military. There is no authorization for the Department of, of uh, Homeland Security, none whatsoever. And this particularly includes the TSA. The TSA is nothing more than security theater. It protects no one. But it has successfully convinced an entire generation of Americans that they do not have rights at airports nor on aircraft. There is extremely little that the federal government is supposed to be able to do in terms of foreign policy, except during a time of declared war. And there is no constitutional authority for undeclared wars. And despite all of the military actions that the U.S. is involved in or has been involved in, the U.S. has not had a declared war since World War II. This makes all of the other military actions flatly unconstitutional by any sane reading of that document. There certainly is no constitutional authority for the federal government to be involved in the United Nations, particularly when it involves ceding a sovereignty of the United States to the United Nations. There is no authorization for the federal government to be involved in other countries' affairs, not funding, not anything else, except during a time of declared war or when there has been a treaty ratified by the Senate that includes solely those powers that are delegated to the federal government. This means that all the military action in all of the countries that I'm about to list are unconstitutional by any sane reading of that document. That would include Afghanistan, Cuba, Iran, Iraq, ISIS, Israel, Palestine, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Russia, Myanmar province, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and North Korea. I mention them specifically because there has never been a declared war. We are currently in what amounts to a state of war with North Korea since 1950. It was an undeclared war that was sold to the populace as a police action, despite the fact that in actual reality, obviously, it was warfare. But it was not declared. And as a consequence, it has never ended. Technically, we are now in a 65-year-long ceasefire with North Korea. Theoretically, we could start shooting at each other anytime. I'd also mention that the federal government is explicitly prohibited under the Second Amendment from being involved in gun control, making any and all federal or state or local gun control laws outright illegal. Null and void. They are unconstitutional. The Second Amendment has nothing to do with hunting. The entire point of the Second Amendment is to allow our citizenry to be as equally armed as our military so that in the event of a revolution, if it became necessary, it would be possible to win. Under the Second Amendment, citizens may own fully automatic weapons, 50 caliber, fire, 50 caliber machine guns, armored vehicles, tanks, aircraft, and even nukes. And we should be able to carry these weapons anywhere 
either concealed or unconcealed. Now, if that frightens you, particularly the part about the nukes, then I suggest you pass a constitutional amendment to say federal citizens can't have them. I understand that the notion of private ownership of nuclear weapons or nuclear explosives is a thorny one. Even as a libertarian, we have a hard time figuring out how to deal with that. But in absence of a constitutional amendment, there we are. And frankly, not having access to them is problematic because you need to be as well armed as your military if you're going to overthrow your government. Beyond that, there is not a single ill that is social or political that cannot be traced directly to government interference in the activities of every American that are totally unconstitutional. You are free. I, I, I invite you, I plead with you, in fact, leave me in a comment any social or political problem that you would like to see my take on, and I will explain to you in detail where the federal government got involved, when it got involved, and how it screwed it all up to the point where we have it now. And this generally involves going back 100 years or more of federal in interference. All of our years, every single one of our ills is due to government interference. Now, if it sounds like what I just suggested suddenly undercuts or destroys um, all these unconstitutional activities just undercut and destroy your favorite politician's political goals, you are absolutely right. Our politicians at every level, every single one, including their staffs, their yes-men, their hangers-on, they're nothing but power-mad sociopathic narcissists. Now, I invite you to look these up. I really do. Look up antisocial personality disorder. In fact, I invite you to look it up so much, I put a link to it in my description box. Also look up narcissistic personality disorder. Link in the description box. Read the list of symptoms, and you will see that enough of them apply, that even someone who is a total layman in psychology can see that these apply. Our politicians, every single one, the president, vice president, all congressmen, all senators, all federal judges are power mad sociopathic narcissists. And all they do all day long is constantly jockey for more power. None of these people work for the governed. They are working to increase their own personal power at almost any cost, and in some cases this may have involved murder. And they do this by the unconstitutional usurpation of power that I have just outlined. They do not care about you. They don't even know who you are, unless you've handed them a big old bribe. Sorry, campaign contribution. Unless you've handed them a campaign contribution of a significant size, they don't know who you are. You are part of a nebulous voting block out there, and they could care less about you aside from voting for them. They do not work for, them, for you. They only care about themselves. And there's a very good reason for this. In 1887, a man named Lord Acton of England wrote some words that should be I think, inscribed on every building, government building everywhere, which was this. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Today's federal politicians have more power than Lord Acton could possibly have ever imagined. The aristocracy in Britain at that time did not have anything like the control over its populace that our federal government has usurped today. This usurpation, dating back a century or more in many cases, means that the federal government now controls every aspect of your life, whether you know it or not. The problem is, so many generations have now been born into a world where every aspect of their life is controlled by government, that they can't see it. And they can't really even imagine what life would be like if the government didn't control every aspect of their life. Remember, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Our federal politicians are all corrupt, every single one of them, including your favorite, and there are no exceptions. This is all due 
to unconstitutional usurpation of power dating back a century or more. To make matters worse, the last two generations of Americans have been, been indoctrinated by 12 years of compulsory education that does not educate, it only indoctrinates, that socialism and communism are good things. They have never been taught any meaningful history because that would mean including the fact that socialism and communism always fail, killing millions of people in the process, either by creating hardships, economic or otherwise, or just by outright killing their citizens. You see, whenever you institute socialism or communism, there are people, like me, that aren't going to go along with it. And so, you kill me. And you kill all the other people who won't go along with it. And that means the people who might have been on the fence figure it out that if they don't fall in line, they're going to be lying in a ditch. That's how socialism and communism works. And you only need to look to history to see that this is true. In the 20th century alone, 150 million or more people were killed in the name of communism and socialism. If you want to look in today, Venezuela a country that was once the richest, most popular nation in South America is now a third world pest hole. And then if you want to look even further, if you want a really good example of what socialism does, I invite you to look at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. This is a place that has been socialist for 150 years. It has never dropped below the number three slot in the number one slums in America and almost always hits the number one. This is what socialism does to you. It creates the number one slum in America. The indoctrination of these generations to believe that socialism and communism are good is problematic because they are now starting to take the reins of power at the federal level. And nowhere is this more evident than Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Her policies are flatly communist, despite the fact that she is trying to bill herself as something else. And we also see this in what is, at this point in time anyway, looking like a front runner for the Democratic nominee for president in 2020, Bernie Sanders. In Bernie's case, it's even worse, because unlike a Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who never had an education, real, a real education, Bernie Sanders has, and he's been around a while. He knows what happens. He just wants to ignore it, because he is a power-mad sociopathic narcissist who believes that he can make the world perfect, as long as he's the one in charge. <laughs> that, by the way. Right on the face of it, that is a symptom of power-mad sociopathic narcissism. And again, look up, look it up, look it up, look up antisocial personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. You can see it for yourself. You can see it for yourself. Now, all of these issues have left our nation, our citizenry, and our entire world in dire straits. It is no longer possible to vote for a non power mad sociopathic narcissist. The reality is you don't get to the federal level. You don't even attempt to get to the federal level unless you are a power mad sociopathic narcissist. So if you vote for one, you outvote one out of office, you just get another. They're all going to be power mad sociopathic narcissists. You cannot reach, you cannot reach the federal level without being a power mad sociopathic narcissist. Even if you vote for a third party, that's not going to work out. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A third party candidate who does not appear to be a power mad sociopathic narcissist will become one when they have absolute power. This, all combined with the rise of socialism and communism among the last two generations, simply makes political solutions impossible. In fact, it is now at a point where we older people must prevent that generation or two from taking power at all. Voting will not accomplish this. Begging for policy changes will not accomplish it. 
the number of times that I have watched people say, oh, vote for me and it'll all be great. Vote for us. It'll all be great. Vote for this change in policy. It'll all be great. And nothing happens. 54 years, and it has only gotten worse. And I know it's gotten worse because if it ever worked, I wouldn't be sitting here telling you we need a second American revolution. And that's the problem. And that's why only a revolution will accomplish this. A revolution, by definition, must have some specific goals. And I would suggest the goals for a second American revolution would be this. First, of course, the reestablishment of the Constitutional Republic as defined by the Constitution. And then, those currently in federal office should immediately vote all federal laws repealed. And they should also vote all federal agencies, including the FBI, CIA, and DHS, dissolved. And then, those in power should immediately resign, whether it's in all branches of government, including all congressmen and senators, the president, the judges, and that includes the Supreme Court. And then from that moment on, these individuals will be disbarred from ever holding public office anywhere ever, not even dog catcher, for the rest of their lives. And the new elections must be organized and held by the states and when these new people come in, in what we hope is a non-socialist federal government at that point, if they pass laws, they must strictly adhere to the letter of the Constitution, not its spirit, not this living, breathing document crap. That document says what they can and can't do. And any new legislation must conform to it strictly. Now, this will create a near powerless federal government. And that is what the Constitution intends. The Constitution intends the federal government to be near powerless. Really what the Constitution does, if you look at the document as a whole, it says, we'll do some stuff that will make sure that interstate trade goes well. If there's a war, we will provide a united front against the enemy. Aside from that, there's not a hell of a lot they do. So this creates a near powerless federal government, and this will therefore reduce the temptation of those who hold those offices to become corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, but if you don't have the power, there's no reason to become corrupt. Not to say that there wouldn't be corrupt. You'd see some corruption, you always do. But if you have a government that does not have the power over your life that this one does, there isn't that much reason to become corrupt. As I said, I am calling for a second American revolution. And there are two ways you can fight it. One of them is the bloody way. This is the one that would look a lot like the American Civil War, pitting son against father and brother against brother and potentially killing millions, maybe tens of millions of people. If you fought a war militarily, it would be fought at a severe handicap because the federal government has gutted the Second Amendment, thereby making it impossible for us to be as armed as our government's militaries. Such a war would require guerrilla warfare and a lot of destruction of infrastructure, an attack and seizure of vulnerable military targets. It could very well result in a fractured country where in what now is the United States, exists multiple smaller countries. I think most people would agree that that would be a bad outcome. So fortunately, however, it is possible to wage a second American revolution without bloodshed, without battles, and win it in only a week. Because you see, Socialists exist in fairly small geographic pockets. Now, they think that they exist in a place that's gigantic and huge and, you know, controls the world. But the fact is they are very small. If you look at a map, very small geographic pockets compared to everything else. This would include things like the eastern seaboard, the southern California seaboard, and basically any city over the population of 150,000. 
Cities tend to become socialist whether their citizens understand it or not. Again, because power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The aristocracy of 1887 did not have the power that mayors and city councils have over their citizens, even in a city of 150,000. Power tends to corrupt, and for them, their absolute power is their little fiefdom, and it corrupts them absolutely. So that's why we have socialists and communists living only in small geographic areas. And this is really good for a second American revolution because all of these places are also dependent on non-socialist areas of the country for their food. This war can be won very, very quickly. If the areas that grow food simply refuse to trade with the entire eastern seaboard, all of the southern California seaboard, and any city with a population of 150,000 or more. This would leave those areas and those cities with about three days' worth of food, probably less, because there would be runs on all the grocery stores, on all of the convenience stores, and their shelves would be emptied in a matter of hours. And within four days, our cities are going to start to feel the effects of starvation. Depending on the availability of water under these circumstances, dehydration will start killing them in only three days. I have to tell you, I have gone. I have been poor enough at various times in my life to have gone without food for more than four days. I have to tell you, you start to feel sick to begin with, and then you get extremely desperate. I mean really desperate, to the point where catching rabbits in the front yard with your bare hands starts to sound like a good idea. In our cities, this would cause food riots. The cities would probably start to burn, and then they would capitulate in extremely short order, probably inside of a week. A second American Revolution can be won in a week. Rather than resorting to guerrilla warfare or even shooting anyone, those who might choose to pick up arms to restore the Constitutional Republic don't make prolonged and bloody battles. Instead, convince America's farmers and ranchers that they should not trade with the eastern seaboard, all of the southern Californian seaboard, and any city over the population of 150,000. Instead, if you are willing to pick up a weapon, place yourself as a guard around those metro agricultural areas so that militaries cannot seize the property and whatever food is being made there. A second American Revolution can be won in a week by simply turning off the spigot to socialist pockets that exist only in centralized population centers. The spigot could then be turned back on when all federal politicians repeal all federal law, abolish all federal agencies, and then all of them, from president on down, including their staffs, hangers-on, and yes-men, resign their posts and vacate the halls of government forever. States would then hold new elections for all federal offices, and should any of the candidates that they come up with be socialists, if they didn't get the message the first time, we turn off the spigot again, and they get to starve until they come up with somebody who's not a socialist. Now, we do have the issue of military forces. Any forces here in the United States, I'd just say if they're based in a state, state takes control until such time as the federal government is at a point where it can deal with it again. Overseas is a bit more complicated. We have a lot of troops overseas. I think you would just need to simply grant them a fair amount of autonomy. Again, a second American Revolution need not be bloody. All you have to do, turn off the spigot. So when the time comes, when the time comes, and that time is now, I hope that those who would engage in a revolution will heed my suggestions. A second American revolution can be won very quickly 
and relatively bloodlessly by simply turning off the spigot to pockets of socialists that are, that are concentrated in population centers throughout the United States. And I guess that that's all I would probably have to say about that subject for today. So thank you for watching. If you like what I'm doing, please do like, sub, hit the notification bell, and tell all your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would certainly appreciate your support, either via subscribe star or my PayPal tip jar, or a place on my website where you can support me further if you like. And there are links to all of those below. So that is Tales from SYL Ranch. And remember... For a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.